I think that answers the question. <laughs> uh, and we'll make this recording available um, for anyone who wants to rewatch or for folks that weren't able to attend. Uh, we aren't 100% sure that's where that's going to live yet, but we'll um, nail that down. Quick um, run through of the agenda. Um, Andy just introduced the Dr. Cog staff. After that, we're going to kind of try to quickly run through everyone present so we get an idea of jurisdictions and the representatives and the roles that they uh, play at their jurisdiction. We'll then briefly talk about the meeting structure and the working group goals, and then we'll jump into a quick outline of what the smaller forecast process looks like um, so that we can get feedback on what portions of that are of most interest uh, to folks going forward. So let's try to quickly go through introductions, just name jurisdiction, um, your role, and then uh, if you'd like a couple words about what you would like to get out of this working group, um, we have ideas of what we'd like to get out of it. We think we may know what you'd like, but um, we'd like to kind of hear all the um, options of what folks are interested in. If it's easiest, I can just run down the, the list on my end. Let me get my participant list up. Um, Brad Boland. Hi, yes, this is, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Brad Boland, I'm the uh, Long Range Project Manager for the town of Castle Rock. And uh, not, not sure what we're looking to get out of this working group yet, so. Fair enough. Um, next is um, Andrew Spurgeon. Uh, thanks, uh, Andrew Spurgeon, City of Westminster. I'm a principal planner in our long range planning and urban design division. And uh, we've worked really well with, with Dr. Cog over the years to get the um, refined numbers for expectations for household and employment. And we look forward to continuing to ensure we have uh, good data to ensure mutual uh, good planning. Thanks. Let's see, I was going down the um, participants list, but now it's reordering on me. Um, Lisa? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's uh, if you're looking for Lisa and Gwen uh, from Den Airport, I'm in for Lisa today. Great. She is the transportation symposium today. Yeah, so, so yeah, my name is George Walker. I'm director of airport planning at Denver Airport. So we look forward to working with you guys on this. Great. Um, Kathleen? Oh, hi. I'm Kathleen Bracke, Boulder County. I'm the Deputy Director of Community Planning and Permitting and lead our transportation planning team. Uh, thanks for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, looks like next is uh, Brandon. Uh, thanks, Brandon Rowe, Principal Planner with the City and County of Broomfield. Um, not really sure what we are, what I'm looking to get out of this. It's the first time I've worked with Dr. Cog. I know a number of staff have worked with you uh, previously. So excited to get involved um, and look forward to seeing what this group does. Uh, looks like Chuck is next. Hi, I'm Chuck Darnell, senior planner at the city of Lone Tree. Um, yeah, I think similar to, similar to others, we're just, Excited to work with Dr. Cog, and uh, we have a lot of forecasting to do for our local jurisdiction and some growth areas we have. So, just interested in getting the best data we can. Um, Dan, 
Uh, looks like there may be a couple. Dan Welsh. Hey, I'm Dan Welsh. I am an air quality meteorologist for the Colorado Department of Public, of, of Public Health and Environment, CDPHE. Um, I'm kind of just here as a fly on the wall for the group, not 100% sure uh, what the overall stated purpose of the group is or how we can fit in. Uh, but obviously our, our jurisdiction encompasses the whole state uh, for matters concerning air quality. Um, so always happy to interact with Dr. Cog. Uh, we've done so in the past on a number of things, but I uh, always just like to keep tabs and uh, see how we can fit in the conversations. Thanks for having me. Um, next up is Daniel um, Kersenowski. Hey everyone, I'm Daniel Kersenowski with the city of Aurora. I'm a supervisor with the Long Range Planning Division. Um, and eager to be part of this group. I think one of the challenges that, that we have with population and population growth is really getting the uh, sort of top down uh, Dr. Cog um, uh, demographer's office data to marry with our sort of ground land use planning and permitting data. Um, if not married, then at least sort of big casually and sort of make some sort of sense uh, together. So um, I'd love to hear about what you all do to, to, to get data to, to work well together. I think next up is uh, David. There we go. Uh, David Gaspers, Principal City Planner, City and County of Denver in Community Planning and Development, uh, oversight of uh, citywide planning in TOD, and was the project manager for Blueprint Denver, our integrated land use and transportation plan, where we worked closely with Dr. Cog's staff to work on our, our city projections and um, look forward to really helping to inform the, the modeling process and hopefully get better outcomes, kind of echoing uh, Daniel's um, take on some of the challenges of rectifying the, the, the DOLA numbers with um, our, our city and land use planning. And next is Erin. Hello, my name is Erin Fosdick. I'm a principal planner with the city of Longmont, um, focusing mostly in long range uh, planning and special studies. Um, similar to what David just mentioned, I can probably just steal everything he said. Um, we've worked really closely with Dr. Cog's staff and um, I work really closely with our transportation planning manager to review and provide input on forecasts in the past. And so for us, I think we just wanna continue to have a, a good understanding of how everything's working and hopefully um, weigh in to get some better outcomes. I think particularly um, as it relates to infill and redevelopment, we've had some kind of questionable um, model results come out and wanna better understand how we can kind of inform the process so that we're more to, to David's point and others closely aligned with what our future plans call for. So thanks for the opportunity to participate. Uh, next up is Frederick. Yes, hi, I'm Fred Roland Hagen. I'm the Planning and Building Services Manager for Clay Creek County up here in Georgetown. Um, and we are uh, just interested in, in, in um, contributing to uh, make uh, forecasting as, as accurate as possible for our small, our small communities up here. Looks like next is George. Oh, we already heard from George. I see the other. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and then Glenda. Hello, I'm Glenda Lanus. I'm the policy planning manager at the city of Thornton. And um, I'm here today. There's someone else from Thornton who's going to be a more uh, regular uh, member. That's um, uh, Thomas. Uh, he'll, you'll speak to him in a moment. And Thornton has been involved with small area forecasting group before. It was really useful and we felt it, 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 it brought a lot of positive things to the city and to the, to the area. And um, we're interested in how the census is going to impact all the numbers and um, also how we can look at pressing regional concerns uh, with, through this group and through the forecasting. Thanks. Um, next is Jeff. 
I'm Jeff Dankenbring, the Public Works Director for the City of Centennial. And we're, we're already engaged with Dr. Cog as part of the TAC and as a representative of Arapahoe County. And so looking forward to staying engaged with Dr. Cog as part of this working group as well. Uh, let's see, uh, Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah Fettig, I'm an associate planner with the town of Parker. Uh, focused with long-range planning, particularly. So, just excited to see where this process goes. See, you know, the data that comes out, how we can leverage that in our long-range plans and projects, and go from there. Let's see. I think we heard from Kathleen already. Uh, Larry. Hi, Larry Mugler. I'm a long-range planner with Arapahoe County, focused, focusing on demographics, uh, and was involved with Dr. Cog long ago in a couple of rounds of small area forecasting. We're about to undertake a uh, water study for the county and want to make sure we have the best forecast uh, that we can work with for that. So hopefully this will help inform that study. So next is Mark. I'm Mark Ambrosi, Senior Transportation Planner with the City and County of Broomfield. Um, we're a fast-growing county in, in Colorado, um, and so we want to make sure that this process, this forecasting process, works as well as it can for, for us. So really happy to be participating in this, this group. Thank you. Um, Phil? Hi, my name is Phil Kleisler um, with the city of Lafayette. Um, work um, focusing mainly on long range planning, um, uh, principal planner. Um, I, a lot of the stuff, um, particularly that Aaron mentioned of um, kind of wanting to just learn more about what goes into this process, but also to kind of ground truth it, ground truth um, the assumptions and all the other data that goes into this. Um, um, and uh, yeah, that's about it. See. Next is Shannon. Hi, I'm Shannon McDowell. I'm the senior long range planner for the city of Brighton. And just like others have said, I just want to learn more about the small area forecasting process and make sure we're collecting the right data, but also that we're using that to its full capabilities. Let's see, next we have Thomas. Hi, Thomas DiMcurio. I am a, a policy planner with the city of Thornton. Uh, and as Glenda mentioned, I am here to um, ensure that as we move forward with our data collection and interpretation process that we're going about it in the right way, as well as to see um, what else Dr. Cog is involved with. Thank you. And let's see, Todd. Yeah, uh, Todd Hager. I'm with the community development folks with uh, the city of Littleton. I'm a planner too, and yeah, I'm just interested in the forecasting and, and sort of the regional connections throughout Littleton. Um, there should be some future corridor studies um, along Broadway and some other uh, corridors. So yeah, just kind of interested in what the data might provide us. Let's see, uh, I think finally, Zeke. Yeah, thanks. This is uh, Zeke Lynch. I'm the traffic engineer at Douglas County, and I guess we're interested in just learning more about how the small area forecast process works and specifically kind of how we can influence um, the process so that kind of our higher growth areas are, are, are clearly represented or appropriately represented in the forecast. So thanks for setting the group up. I think that is everybody and then we won't put them on the spot, but just to let folks know, we've also have um, Robert Spots from the transportation group listening. He drives the bus on the transportation model. And we've got um, Rachel Piersdorf and um, Byron Shunt, um, GIS specialists, and Jenny Wallace, the GIS manager. Um, their, their group um, is pretty integral, as we'll see, to, to making all of this work. All right, let me clear out some windows now. OK, so. Just a quick chat about the um, meeting structure going forward. 
we'd like this to be uh, a mix of Dr. Cog presenting um, what we're working on and um, how our process works, but we'd also like a lot of it to be participant discussion. So we're aiming for 50-50. We may not hit that at maybe 60-40, 70-30, but we'd like there to be a lot of discussion um, and a lot of feedback uh, from the participants. They're generally gonna be virtual for the time being. Um, partly that's gonna make things a lot easier all around instead of having to <laughs> waste a half a day um, coming up to Dr. Cog's offices. So um, hopefully the virtual works for everybody. And we're looking at three to four meetings a year, probably not quite hitting quarterly, um, probably more of them as we um, start working our way through um, the next forecast. Just a comment, feel free to, to ask any questions, make any comments. Uh, there are some folks monitoring the chat, so if you would prefer, you can drop questions in the chat or um, just interrupt raise your hand, whatever, totally fine. Um, I'm gonna present a wireframe outline of what we do. I have no problem bumping some of that to next time. If this, if we really only focus on the first half and, and start digging a little deeper today, that's totally fine. Um, so feel free to interrupt any time. Uh, this, these bullet points here are some of the broad um, groupings of things we'd like to cover over the next, set of meetings, technical deep dives into different portions of the small air forecast. Uh, for example, how we estimate block level capacities for residential um, units and employment, um, how we handle um, the control totals that we get from the state demography office, um, all of these pieces of the forecasting process, we'd like to kind of dig in deeper. Part of that is for transparency. Uh, we'd like everyone to understand what we're doing, um, but also we don't really think that you'll be able to give us feedback on, on the process unless you understand um, where, kind of what the technical pieces are and where we have levers that we can, we can work with. We also hope to kind of beta tests, some new data products and deliverables, um, even outside of the strictly forecasting process, there may be um, ways that we can be using and looking at this data. Um, so we'll be bouncing that off you guys to see what resonates um, and would be of use to the region. We may also have some outside presentations. Um, State Demography Office is usually pretty happy to come in and discuss their work. Uh, we also may have somebody from our um, transportation side discuss the transportation model, since that's um, a little bit beyond what we should be talking about, since it's kind of out of our wheelhouse. Um, we will also kind of work through the process of how we get jurisdiction um, feedback for this model. Um, and what ways we can improve that process. And, and it's possible that there'll be um, white papers or data briefs or something of that nature that also come out of uh, this group. We've got kind of a, a, a soft list of goals. Um, we are constantly improving this process. Of, of how we do this forecasting. We're actually in the middle of a big improvement phase now. Um, so we'd like to keep people up to speed on, on how that's working and what improvements were being made to see if we're missing something, but also to keep everyone clear what's going on. We'd also like to facilitate more coordination with the state demography office. Um, they have a um, fairly ingrained structure of getting feedback from counties, but they have less of a relationship with, um, with the smaller jurisdictions. Dr. Cog does have a relationship with those jurisdictions, so it, it makes sense for us to kind of help facilitate some of that discussion um, to let them know um, where their forecasts could be improved. Uh, we also want to discuss more broadly 
topics in the Denver region, such as affordable housing, um, all these issues that are kind of around our forecast, but not kind of directly related, we, we think this could be a good venue. And then we'd like a lot of feedback on um, this modeling process and our assumptions. Where do those assumptions seem reasonable? Where are we cutting too many quarters from, a, uh, from an analysis standpoint? Any questions or comments before we jump into a, a quick overview of what this forecasting process looks like? Okay, so we've kind of broken out this process into five steps. We take a lot of input data, we process that data, we kind of throw it into this um, block model, we then post-process that data and we pass that off to the travel model. So we're gonna go through each of these steps individually. What we generally think of as the Dr. Cog small area forecast are these first four. So the travel model is not part of this process, but we, we do a lot of the post-processing um, and in some sense, the QC uh, of that data. So it kind of gets us right up to where the travel model starts. A lot of the data we use is coming from um, the state demography office, the county level forecasts for employment, households and population are all used in this forecasting process. Um, particularly households are given by household type and also age of head. So we're able to get some pretty good detail about the demographics of um, the jurisdictions and the counties going forward. The zoning data is processed by the GIS team um, along with the assessor's data. We use a lot of public data. So the, the 2010 census, the 2020 census, the ACS um, and the PUMS coming out of the census. Uh, we also use LHD for employment data. And then there's a handful of subscriptions that Dr. Cog processes as well. QCW data, CoStar, we've just, in the last year started working with Zonda data on um, future developments and then the planimetrics data where um, um, aerial photography is processed to give us an idea of where there are new um, units being built. There's a couple general steps to processing this data. First off, we have to build a, um, a base year set of data. For employment, we use LEHD. And for households, we use the 2010 census and the ACS in combination. Another big source of data going into this model is what um, in the modeling process for Urban Sim Bank is called scheduled development. And basically, we are able to um, manually override the kind of predictive nature of the model and place housing into blocks and place employment into blocks. The benefit of that is that while we have a 2010 base year, we can look at on the ground in 2022 at using Dr. Cox Master Housing, um, QCW, Zonda, um, public records, jurisdiction input, and we can make the model apply that um, exactly or close to exactly. So the 2022 looks pretty close to what we see on the ground. So we're not gonna have the issue where a new apartment goes in in 2017 and we're never gonna be able to see that because it wasn't there in 2010. So we use a lot of this data to kind of produce a quasi 2020 base year. So the model actually starts running in 2010, but through the current year, we're prescribing where a lot of the jobs and housing are gonna land. After 2022, most of these data sets are no longer useful. QCW, our master housing, public records have some on master plan communities. Um, 
But this is where we rely a lot on jurisdiction input and um, Sonda um, has also been useful for providing a lot of data on where we expect particularly housing um, to land after 2022. Another piece of processing that's done is the construction of a synthetic population. In a lot of ways, this is pretty boring. It's just kind of a, a modeling step that we have to, when, we, when the model samples a household and places it somewhere in the region, all of the accompanying pieces of a household have to be there. So a household has people. So how many adults, how many children do they, do they have a car? Um, what is their income? What is their employment? Um, all the characteristics of households, we want that to go along with the placement of the household. To do that, we take the um, census PUMS data and construct this synthetic population that we can sample from. Where it becomes a less of just a boring modeling exercise is that this synthetic population does not change across time. So it's constructed with roughly 2013 data. In 2040, 2050, we know that households are going to look very different. They're going to be many more older adults. There are going to be fewer children. There are going to be more um, adults living together without children. So all of these. Um, all of these pieces of, of changing demographics out through 2040, 2050, mean that when we pass this data off to the travel model, our population doesn't look the same. So a lot of the model improvements that we, we've been working on, a lot of the post-processing that has to be done is to deal with that static synthetic population. Is that, can we hold there for a sec? Yeah, it looks like I was just going to click on the chat. It looks like maybe a... Yeah, I was, that, the the previous slide about the synthesized population is a good answer to Aaron's question here about when we anticipate switching to the 2020 census data. This is actually our constraint with, with doing that switch. Um, we have to wait for there to be at least enough years of the synthetic population um, to, so that the public use microsample data to be available within those geographies, uh, the, the new um, 2020 census geography. So it'll be a little while before we can we can make that switch um, or even consider it. And with all the stuff that's changing about how um, the, the ACS, uh, American Community Survey and, and all that, um, I think it's really gonna, we're in a wait and see moment to see uh, what some of the other folks using this model are doing as well to make that move. Yeah, um, we let's let me go back actually one more. The base year construction needs the ACS. So at a minimum, we may need to wait till 2024, 2025 to get um, a decent amount of ACS data. Um, the 2020 census will give us the roughly give us the households, but the ACS is then going to apply those attributes. Um, to set up the base year. And as Andy said, we're, we'd rather not be bleeding edge. We'd like to let some other uh, MPOs bump up to the next census year and see how that process goes. Um, at the moment for us, we don't see a huge benefit uh, with a fair amount of risk. Um, we will, however, incorporate what comes out of the 2020 census. Um, at a minimum, it, it comes in through the demography office uh, forecasts are, are pegged to that 2020 census. Any other questions? I'll just add on to that. It really is nice that um, we have this scheduled development tool um, because we're able to use a lot of the local data that you all are providing um, to really try and get us up to a more current observed year. And so we're also not beholden to the census and some of the issues folks may have seen uh, with the 2020 census results. Uh, the next piece of pre-processing data, this is actually a big chunk of, of the work 
to get this model up and running. Um, we ended up doing a lot of this in-house instead of having Urban Sim Inc. do it because we felt that we really wanted a lot of control over this. And as we go through, I, th I think it'll be clear why that's so important. We're gonna look at a few uh, maps and you'll kind of see why this was a difficult process. The GIS team did a lot of work to get us the mapping and data uh, we needed to do this process. Um, so there was a lot of work on the front end and then a lot of work to um, see this process through. It's a pretty big part of how we incorporate jurisdiction feedback. So I suspect that in the future, we'll do a deeper dive on this step um, of how, how we estimate at the block level, how many jobs and how many residential units can fit into each block. To give a quick overview though, what we have is we're stuck with the issue that across the Denver region, we've got something on the order of 2,200 plus zone types. Um, that's a lot to read through. And even if we were reading through that, it's not always clear that what would we would calculate will fit is actually what a jurisdiction tends to allow in that type of zoning anyway, whether it's um, at the um, zoning level or if it's just NIMBYism, there, there are kind of restrictions on what can be built that um, tend to be subtle to for someone outside of the jurisdiction to understand. So we try to estimate this um, using our master housing data. And what this is going to ultimately let us have are two big levers that we can adjust for every type of zoning within every jurisdiction. We can manually go in and, and, and assign the jobs per acre and the residential units per acre. Um, and at the block level, we can also go in and assign the jobs per acre and the residential units per acre. So those are kind of the two big levers that come out of this process. Let's look at a couple maps, and I think it may hopefully become clear enough that we can wait to come back to this in more detail down the road. This is roughly the most of the Denver region with every one of these colors being a different zoning type. Um, so you can kind of start to see the difficulties in um, reading through all of these and figuring out what will fit into each zoning type. Here is basically right around Dr. Cog offices. I'm actually not in the office, so it's not right here, right here, but um, this is the, all the zoning types around Dr. Cog's offices. When we put this into the model, we don't need to be putting in um, what the setback needs to be, what the minimum lot requirement is, what the FAR would be, how many levels. What we really need is just units per acre. So we would like to get to something like this. We'd like to simplify the problem and, and calculate how many units per acre will fit into each block. And then we can apply that to the area of the block. If we look at a few blocks around the capital, this is the zoning for these um, blocks. And what we can see is that within a block, there could be multiple zoning types. So what, what happened is the GIS folks were able to, using their point level data, tell us within each block and within each section of that block by zoning type, how many jobs and how many housing units were in those portions of blocks. We then looked across the entire jurisdiction for that zoning type. For example, if it's R1 for a certain jurisdiction, we would look at all the blocks that have a portion or all R1, see how dense the housing is, and then we took the 80th percentile and we used that as kind of the maximum that would fit in that zoning type. 
The benefit of that is that for the vast majority of the zoning types across the region, it works, it worked pretty well. We ended up with a unit per acre and um, jobs per acre that really made sense, was pretty close. We weren't overbuilding when the model runs, we weren't overbuilding in um, fairly established neighborhoods, which was um, a big problem with the previous model. It was just a starting point. Um, the Denver region has some really big blocks. Um, there are some in the Northeast that are bumping on 60,000 acres. Even if you've got a zoning type that says something like 35 acre lots, you're still gonna have the capacity way over um, too high for a block that big. So we made adjustments for unincorporated areas, um, large blocks. Um, we also did some breakdown between urban and rural based on census de designation. Um, and that gave us the starting point where we now have reasonable jobs and housing densities for every zoning type in the region. And then we manually went in and changed those that either we noticed or jurisdictions noticed were off. So if we look at the next slide, the feedback process, we basically run the model and then we see where everything's landing. And we look at that map, we, we have jurisdictions look at that map and they tell us, oh, you're building way too much in this area. Well, we can ratchet down at the block level, but more easily we can ratchet down at the zoning type level. So if we look and see that where we're overbuilding is a certain zoning type, we could, for, for example, lower the residential density from eight units per acre to five units per acre and rerun the model. And then we might see that we're getting closer and that that area um, is no longer overbuilding. So every time we get this feedback, we're basically just changing our, um, pulling a few levers that we have and then rerunning the model. The big levers that we have to work with are these ones that come from this estimation process. We can adjust the zoning level capacity. So any zoning type for any jurisdiction, we can adjust that for um, how many units per acre and how many jobs per acre. We can also go in and manually adjust at the block level, particularly if there's blocks um, that a jurisdiction tells us there will be no building. We often just go in and zero those blocks out. Um, and then the third big piece is, is adjusting the schedule development. So if a jurisdiction tells us we're missing an apartment complex that just went in, we can go in and, and um, have that be added to the schedule development and it'll show up then um, in the correct year. This process, is something that we'll probably do a deep dive since it's so integral to, to how we get this model to, in a sense, behave the way we would like. Um, full disclosure, these predictive models don't always work great. And we really feel that the value we can bring to it is that we can look on the ground and jurisdictions can look on the ground and tell us, oh, this isn't fitting, this doesn't look right. And by really putting a lot of effort into this um, capacity estimation and schedule development, we're able to take a lot of the pressure off the model. We can build, we can kind of establish through these levers what 2022 looks like. And now the model doesn't need to be applying that. We can even look and see where we expect master plan communities, for example, in the coming years, and then the model doesn't have to do that work. So we're, we really like to be getting as much feedback as we can, and this is the way we incorporate it into the model. When we talk about a model run, it's important to be clear that every year is a new model run. So in a sense, we start in 2010, 
one year cycle of the model is 2011. And the model could be stopped there. It really doesn't make any difference. We, we plug in a number in the, in, the, in the model for when it should stop, but it basically does the same thing every single year. So 2010 to 2011 is a model run for that year. And then 2011, 2012, and every single year. Some of these things don't change. The block level capacity is the same from 2010 to 2050. Travel skims do change. The, obviously, the state demography office control totals change. Um, scheduled development changes since we assign which year um, we expect units and jobs to show up and over what duration. So we have some data that doesn't change, some data that does change. And here in the blue are the, what in this, modeling setting are called um, choice models. So there's a model that we estimate that tells us where in the region will residential units land. We have another model that says where will jobs land and another model that's, that looks at where households will land. Um, households, importantly, we are working on stratifying by age of head, um, and household type to hopefully get uh, more reasonable population demographics um, that come out. Um, jobs, the assignment of that, those models are stratified by sector. So there's a separate predictive model for each job sector um, and residential units by type. So whether they're rental or own and whether they're single family or multifamily. So uh, we're looking at Four models are estimated for residential type, six for job placement, and 12 for households because of the way we've stratified that. that uh, David Gasper has a question about switching from the urban SIM parcel level model to the block level model. Um, Maybe the easiest is to bump back a few slides and look at the input data required. Uh, all of this data, we really only have to get it to the block level. And it doesn't have to be perfect because um, there's no real developer model in the same sense there was in the parcel model. So the parcel model previously, it would, we had to make sure we knew exactly what type of building was there. And then a developer model would say, oh, you know, this, val this land's valuable. It is right for development. So the model would, in a sense, add another story to the housing. It would expand the capacity of housing and um, buildings. So it actually build buildings for employment. That meant that all of that data had to be accurate to the parcel. So all of the housing and employment data and data on the buildings had to land in that parcel. And that was a lot of work. Um, it also meant that it was really hard to update that data year to year. So when we switched to the block model, this was 2019 we were able to use scheduled development to kind of bring it up to a quasi 2018, 2019 base year. In the parcel model, previously they had spent, been spending two or three years to bring the base year up to 2015 and they still hadn't QC'd it yet um, as, we were, as we decided to switch the block model. So the, the main issue is that the, the data, data needs were massive. Um, and it was very hard to kind of bring the model up to a more current year. Um, not only do we not even need data on the buildings, our model now has no information on what type of buildings for um, commercial or residential anywhere in the region. We just need to know how many housing units, what type they are, um, how many jobs and what type they are. It doesn't matter what kind of building they're in. Um, so the data needs in that sense are much, much easier. Um, another big piece 
which I don't think we even realized how valuable it would be until the model was up and running. Being able to adjust schedule development wasn't possible in the previous model. Um, so we weren't able to assign um, building of, of essentially of jobs and housing, of having those land. And that really limited um, how accurate to the current year we could get the model. Um, we also, because of the way we're, we are um, estimating the capacity, the zoning and the block level capacities are jobs per acre and housing units per acre, which at least for me is super intuitive. FAR is a tough thing to kind of wrap your head around when you, when you start looking across the region, particularly when you start looking at larger blocks, um, trying to figure out how dense you're gonna end up with a, with a major new development. Um, it's really intuitive for us internally to talk about units per acre and talk with stakeholders. Um, so that's kind of the greatest hits of why we ended up switching over. Um, the initial reason was because of the data limitations, the, the difficulty of running that parcel model. But there have been then all these additional benefits as we've gone through. And we're pretty happy with the decisions. We meet with a lot of other NPOs pretty regularly. Um, and a lot of them that have been trying to more recently switch to a parcel model, they've had a lot of problems and it's a much longer process. We were, we were able to get this model up and running in about six months and used it for the RTP in just about a year. Um, a lot of MPOs we're talking with have been trying to get their models up and running for two or three years. So we were pretty happy with how relatively smooth the process went. Sorry, that was probably a longer <laughs> answer, David, than you were looking for. No, no, actually, it's exactly what I wanted to hear. I mean, I just, I guess I wanted to ensure that you, you also feel like not only is it easier, but it, it's at least as, or if not more accurate, I guess, for the purpose of the model, right? I just wanted to make sure that just because it wasn't as detailed, we were losing accuracy, which sounds like is the case. Yeah, and there's also the benefit that, um, block level and zoning level adjustments at, in terms of units per acre. Um, that's something we could make pretty major changes to our model and it would still be relevant. Um, so that feedback we can carry over year to year to year. Mm -hmm. um, I know Dr. Cock had previously made a lot of um, adjustments in the Denver area, but a lot of that was based on FAR and as those changes were made, the parcel model would kind of just blow up and move things all around. Yeah, so you know. anytime there was a big update to the model, all of that adjustment of the FARs to get things to land in a reasonable way, that all had to be redone. So we're, we're also really happy that anything somebody tells us, they say, hey, these five blocks should have nothing in them, or these five blocks need more. Next time around, that feedback um, doesn't need to be told to us again. Hopefully, we can kind of carry that over. Um, right. and, and to clarify on that, Zach, really quick, is with the zoning level, the adjustment there, if, if we tell you, like, oh, there should be a lot more in those five blocks, um, I'm saying that's typically actually, from our perspective, based off of the future uh, zoning, something that's not tech, actually on the ground today. It's usually something that has plan recommendation, but it may not be the actual existing zoning. You would just switch it to the the what the expected new zoning would be to to reflect that greater density. Is that fair to say? Is that how you do it? <laughs> well, it's we're sort of in a bind. If if it's if we talk with a jurisdiction and it seems like this is going forward. Um, we can make those types of changes. It's tough if we look at a comp plan and a jurisdiction tells us, oh, these are our plans down the road, but the zoning hasn't been changed. It's hard for us to know, is there gonna be a zoning overhaul next year or is it gonna be in 10 years or is it never gonna materialize? Um, 
So we, we have to kind of work with the jurisdiction to get an idea of, um, is that zoning change pretty much done or is it more aspirational? Um, so it definitely differs jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Um, we've not implemented, implemented it yet, but um, we're hopeful to be able to incorporate capacity changes in later model years um, mm -hmm. so that say 2010 to 2025, we would use one set of capacities. And then if a jurisdiction tells us 2025 is the year that that change is going to be live, we could change that capacity from 2025 to 2050. Mm -hmm. um, we've not incorporate, we've not kind of QC that process yet. In some sense, it's not a big deal because for a lot of purposes, it doesn't actually matter whether the new construction lands in 2021 or 2031. It's kind of what happens in 2040, 2050. Um, but it's something we're exploring. Okay, yeah, I, I probably have a lot more to follow up on, on that yeah. because I think that's well, one and, of our biggest and, challenges with, with the model is how to tweak that because- And an, another thing is that when there are zoning changes, our estimation process does not work very well, right? Because we're looking at say R1 and now there's been a zoning change and R1 doesn't mean the same thing. Maybe it's still called R1 or maybe it's called R1X. There hasn't been time for construction to occur under this new, under these new zoning rules. So we don't know how dense it's gonna look on the ground. So that's where we need much more jurisdiction feedback for them mm -hmm. to tell us, oh, you know, these are the new zoning changes. This one looks like the old one, but this other one is twice as dense as it used to be. That's the type of feedback we need um, to be able to incorporate those changes. Makes sense. Yeah, a question we get a lot is why we don't use some sort of future land use classification and, um, that's really where we, as Zach has been describing, where we rely on that, that local feedback. Um, we don't have good sort of wall-to-wall -wall coverage in our region um, of those future land use plants. And so it makes it hard for us to rely on that. And as much as we'd want to use that, um, it's, we have to rely on zoning because it is something that, that we can get from everyone. Yeah, no, completely understand. And again, I think it's a, continued conversation, but from an input standpoint, I mean, our biggest challenge with getting the, the model accurate is infill opportunities, right? And typically the existing zoning does not reflect what the planned uh, development would be. Now, when is it happening? That's the, the always the, the big question, um, but uh, that, that's the greatest challenge in getting an accurate idea of like capacity, for example, because it just simply not accurate to look at a, a TOD site and that's zone industrial and say, well, it's just going to stay industrial. At some point, it's going to flip and we have a plan for it. We just don't know when, right? So, yeah. Um, I mean, this is getting very specific in the weeds, but yeah. for example, around um, oh, kind of, oh, what would it be? Sort of near the, um, East of course field where there's a lot of redevelopment. Um, Rappo sure, Square. Rhino. Or Rappo Square, either one. Yeah, like where we could yes, or we Rhino. can see that there's going to be a zoning change and we know what we know that new zoning change. And sometimes sometimes we would try to crosswalk to a very similar but previous zoning type. So we would mm -hmm. read through the zoning code. We're like, oh, you know, this new one, it sounds a lot like this old one. And we would try to see how dense did that build out. And we would then just manually override that um, mm -hmm. section. Uh, so we have a lot, of, a lot of ways that we can kind of um, try to get to a, a better answer. Um, and also with this flexibility, it's nice that we can, um, we can really goose the numbers or squash them down in a lot of different ways um, while still leaving the model to kind of be predictive on its own. Sure, sure. No, I just think it just emphasizes the, the value of um, the local community input into the model. So appreciate it, guys, thanks.
let's see what the next, so we looked at this. Oh, so just a, a brief um, on what this post model data processing looks like. We pass this data off to the transportation model, but we first have to convert our block level data to traffic analysis zones. Um, that's tricky because they don't line up all the time. And in some cases, blocks are bigger than traffic analysis zones. And sometimes tra traffic analysis zones are bigger than blocks. Um, so there ends up being a point mesh created. And then we kind of delete off all the points that would be in floodplains and parks and golf courses and try to do that crosswalk as carefully as we can. Um, particularly for some of the larger blocks. If you have a really big block right next to an interstate, you would kind of expect that most of the new employment would be landing on the side closer to the interstate. So we try to do this process um, so that that ends up being the case, that things land where they would most reasonably land. Uh, we also calculate a lot of accessibility measures for the travel model. Um, and then we do a lot of demographic quality control and adjustment to match the state demography office forecast. We're strictly modeling households, but in 2050 households are going to be smaller. So we end up actually having a population that's way too big. Um, so we have to make some adjustments to household size to get that population back down. Uh, looks like there's another question. Uh, yeah, so it's uh, how, how to deal with PUDs. And this is really difficult. The estimation process really doesn't work for PUDs. So any jurisdictions that are primarily PUDs, we tended to impute um, from kind of the county level. So we would look at um, if, if we think that it's kind of primarily a commercial PUD or more of a residential PUD, we would look across the county and see kind of how dense that became. Uh, but yeah, any, any PUDs took a lot of um, hands-on work from us to kind of adjust those estimates. Are there more questions that, okay, I think we're caught up on questions. Uh, just a quick rundown of some of the model improvements that we're just now finishing up and hopefully we will have those done in the next four to six weeks and we can start doing some model runs and see how we're looking. Uh, we changed the model for stratifications for households. So it used to be we stratified by income, we expect higher and lower income households to choose to live in different areas of the region. So it makes sense that we would have a separate choice model for each of those. The problem is it's not all about income. Uh, so this time we're also stratifying by age of head. So older um, adult households make choices differently and households with children make choices differently. So we've broken it out by older adult households, low and high income, and then younger adult households with and without children. And then we broke each of those up into four levels of income. Um, so we're hopeful that the, particularly the household location choice models will um, work better in this next um, kind of what we're sort of calling version 1.2. Um, inside the choice models, we've, we've stripped down a lot of the variables and tried to make it a little more intuitive and clean. And we're hopeful that this is going to work a little bit better. We're right now in the calibration stage working with Urban Semank. So we should know how well this is working in the next four to six weeks. Uh, we're also stratifying the county level household control totals. Previously, we just had how many households in every county. Um, now we're going to be breaking out by age of head and presence of children. Um, that should hopefully um, mean that our population and demographics look much more realistic in 2050. Uh, the last big improvement, um, 
the urban cement kind of keeps the block model pretty static um, until it's time to make um, some improvements. So they've incorporated kind of the last two years of improvements. So um, hopefully that will make the model runs, continue to run smoothly um, and work well. Um, we're gonna go through a Mintimeter survey, but before we do it, are there any other uh, questions or comments from anybody before we jump into the survey? Can just shout them out or drop them in the chat. Okay, well, let's go to the survey and maybe during that survey process, um, if you go to www.menti.com, it'll prompt you to put in this eight digit code. Um, alternatively, you can just hold your phone over the QR code if you wanted to do this on a phone. And that's gonna be um, the website. I'm gonna try, I'm gonna pull it up here as well. Let's see, I've got to switch screens. All right, is that showing up for folks? All right, I'm just gonna leave this here for another few seconds um, so folks can go to this page. Um, note that, uh, the code and Menti is gonna be on the top of these pages um, going forward. So if you're still heading to the page, anyone want some extra time to get there? Uh, what these questions are gonna cover, first, just some brief questions about what jurisdiction you're from, what your role is, uh, but then we're going to go through um, some very model specific topics and try to gauge interest for what people would like um, future working group meetings to cover. So we've really just kind of scratched the surface of this process. So we'd like to um, see which of these topics we should do a deeper dive. Um, then there'll be a section of um, more kind of outside of the modeling process, just generally um, things like zoning, ADUs, affordable housing, topics that um, we want input from this working group to see if we're thinking of them in the right way um, and incorporating the right way into the forecast. Okay, so let's get started. If folks could just um, say what jurisdiction they represent. And we did go through introductions, so, so there shouldn't be any major surprises, but um, I'm very pleased that we've got a, um, a good, cross-section of um, the counties, large jurisdictions, small jurisdictions, um, and then north to south, east to west, we've got, we've got jurisdictions from all over the area. So this is a, a really good mix. I think we've probably got most folks. So I'm gonna jump to the next slide. And what is your role? Um, we're anticipating a lot of planners, uh, but I also heard in the introductions uh, um, some transportation folks. Um, so there's a variety. All 
right, that looks like we've got a pretty big contingent of folks having answered. And how many years have you been at this jurisdiction? So we'd like to get an idea, um, particularly within the last few years, there's been um, all over the region, a lot of turnover. So getting an idea of, of how that's affecting your, your groups. Yeah, a lot of folks have been there a long time. We're seeing a chunk in the middle of three to five years and um, some in the less than one year, one to two year range. It could be that the newer folks were uh, forced to come talk to us today. <laughs> All right, so these are gonna be just sliders. You can slide across to designate how much interest you have in each of these topics. So these are very process oriented. Um, how we handle the um, state demography office control totals, their forecast, um, block level employment capacity estimation, model selection, synthetic population, building to that quasi base year. So even though we we haven't updated our um, base year, how do we get there? And then schedule development. And, and some of these things, for example, model selection and estimation, um, that's a pretty prescribed process with Urban Sim Inc. Um, so while in some of these cases, we may not be able to take the feedback and make too many changes. It could be next time we could incorporate different variables. Um, it could also be that if folks understand better how we are selecting these, they can give us um, better feedback on what we're selecting. Uh, so it looks like we're loading up on demography office. Certainly we'll be having more in-depth discussions on, on the demography office, particularly how we can kind of facilitate some feedback from uh, cities and towns to the demography office, since a lot of their interaction is uh, historically been at the county level. And I know that they are um, eager to, to kind of make more inroads into um, city and towns in the Denver region. Uh, capacity estimation um, and schedule development. So yeah, no surprises here. All those are super high on our list as well. Uh, after the model um, concludes, there's a lot we do with this data. So some of it is for review purposes. Um, so how we, we do review internally, externally, how we integrate that. Um, for folks that, that were around for the last RTP, we set up a, um, a web portal where folks could drop pins and make comments So how that process worked. Um, how we create the data sets for travel model, and then also what data is made publicly available. Um, we can definitely change a lot of these processes based on, um, on your feedback in the future. So about 13 people, I may wait another few seconds to see if we get a couple more. All right, looks to be about like we probably expected. Um, a lot of interest in the local feedback, more interest than I, than I thought in, in how these data sets are made public. Um, and no one's super interested in the Dr. Cog review process. We could be throwing darts at the wall and that may be <laughs> um, all, all, we, all we're doing. Uh, yeah, so these will be 
definitely things to drill down into in the future. Um, particularly the integration of lo local feedback is very much tied to how we do this um, block estimation. And we'll leave this one up for, for just a few seconds of people. If there's additional things, additional aspects of this, very the forecast process itself um, that we should be focusing on. If there's something that we're not thinking of, All right, I'm going to go on to the next slide. Anyone has additional feedback in this sense? Um, sensitivity modeling. Um, yes, that is uh, a good topic for discussion. Um, Yeah, I think um, the sub area groups that um, the transportation side has been working on. Um, yeah, I think there could be a good place for um, some more targeted regional discussion since um, they kind of face different, um, different challenges and different pr um, pressures. Um, and even if this smaller forecasting group doesn't isn't able to kind of break out into smaller groups, we definitely have the time and capacity to be meeting with folks to have similar conversations with smaller subsets of this group and then can kind of report back. Um, yeah, but sensitivity modeling is something we definitely would like to know, like how, how are, are changing, pulling these levers, making a difference in our model to really have an idea of where we should be um, putting our focus. Integration of annexations on model assumptions, that's another good point. Um, the only way this comes in so far is that if we see two zoning types, if there's a county level and a jurisdiction level, a, a city or town level, we assume that the city or town is going to annex the portion of the county. Uh, but that's definitely something we, we can discuss, how, how we should be um, incorporating that into our model. I'm going to jump to the next slide. If I cut anyone off, feel free to just email. Oh, another one came in. Uh, open space acquisitions. Uh, could this be used to model future scenarios? Um, yeah, I think it definitely could be used for scenario work. It's pretty flexible. So if a jurisdiction tells us um, we are potentially going to change the capacities um, across a corridor, we can, we can make that adjustment relatively quickly um, and see what kind of effect that would have. Um, and open space acquisitions, there's a open space layer um, that we, is part of that zoning so that those areas get um, designated as no build. Um, but definitely how we can kind of keep that updated um, is important. Um, urban center stationary forecasts. Uh, that's something that Andy has been particularly interested in how we can kind of come up with um, some new geographies that are, are, are useful for um, identifying areas where jurisdictions see a lot of potential. Um, but I'm not sure if I'm seeing the entire question here. It's cut off. Is there backcasting on the land use side to see how well models are? And it's cut off on my screen. Oh, there it is. Uh, how well models are working. Um, no, there isn't, and, and I think we could definitely talk through that. It's difficult um, because a lot of the data we have available is back through 2010, actually before 2010, is used to estimate and calibrate. Um, 
but definitely coming up with good metrics for um, how well this model is working is something we can discuss. It's also something that uh, we're part of a AMPA working group. And this is one of the things that that's of, of interest to us as a working group with AMPA is how do we evaluate success and, and how do we measure that? Um, because it's not always clear when you have this 2050 forecast, is it any good? Um, yeah, and wildfire risk, um, I think it's another good topic that we can um, focus on. These next sets of questions are um, a little bit less kind of in the process of what the forecast, how we do the forecast, and more are we thinking about these issues in the correct way? So zoning, comprehensive plan, missing middle affordable housing, mass point communities, demographic shifts, slowing population growth, commercial versus residential developments. Um, even though we often don't incorporate, say, affordable housing directly into our forecast, there are um, kind of implicit pieces of that in the model. So how should we be thinking about these things as we're doing the modeling process to make this model accurate? We have about 10 minutes left. So I think we're just on track. So I'll leave this up for another couple seconds, see if we can get another one or two folks. Uh, you can see this says part one, meaning there's going to be a part two. Uh, so similarly, what of these topics um, would folks like to discuss to, so that we can know if we're incorporating them correctly? I think we're just about done. So are there any topics that um, folks would like us to focus on? Um, I know PDs came up in the chat. I think that's a good topic of discussion. How are we incorporating PDs and in what ways can we do better? Um, some of these topics would need a fair amount of jurisdiction input, but maybe we can make that process easier. Um, any other topics? Anyone can feel free to email me anything that comes up or any thoughts that they have down the road. Yeah, these are these are good things to discuss. So what what are we going to be doing? How do we incorporate um, new zoning changes, um, very large employment centers?
yeah, I think all of these are good topics to be um, looking into. And some of these are getting into the transportation model side, but that's something we can definitely bring in somebody. Um, I'm looking at the participant list, see if he's, yeah, Robert Spots drives the bus over there. And I think he's still listening. So <laughs> we may impose on him to discuss some of these down the road. All right, I, I think we have, that may be it. Okay, so let me, Stop that. And I'm just gonna put back up, I'll send out these slides for particularly the um, contact information. Um, if anyone wants to reach out to us. Um, and yeah, we'll take all this, take stock of, of the feedback today and start working on a plan for the next meeting. Anyone have any questions or comments um, they would like to ask now? We've got a few minutes left. I just want to thank everyone again. We've had lots of good feedback here, lots of good participation in those polls. So I really look forward to hearing from you more. I just want to say great job. Um, that was a lot of talking and I'm sure a lot of prep work for you all. So thanks for, for that. Thanks, yeah, we're, uh, as Andy said, we're super thrilled with um, the numbers we've got today. It's a, a great cross section of the region and it's to me feels like a perfect size, big enough that we can be doing some breakout rooms in the future, um, but small enough that uh, we can really have some, some discussions and, and uh, good participation. Uh, this is something that's been on our radar for at least a year, but because of kind of some overlapping uh, projects, we kind of pushed it off till now. So we're really thrilled to be getting this um, going and, and to um, getting feedback. Great. Well, thanks everyone. Um, and I'll, I'll be following up um, with um, an email with the PowerPoint slides. And when we figure out where the recording is gonna live, we will also uh, send that out. Thanks a lot, everybody.